Good day, and welcome to the launch event of the MIT Architecture Alumni Association's Future of the City event series. I'm Constance Boduro, currently serving as co-president of the MidArca Board of Directors. I'm a class of 1991 from both uh, course four and course 11. On behalf of MidArca and all of our collaborators, we thank you for joining us virtually today from your diverse geographies and time zones. Before I introduce today's event, I'd like to recognize the other volunteer alumni leaders who've collaborated with me over the last nine months to create this event. First, uh, as you see on the slide, my fellow MidArca board members, Bill Gilchrist, who serves with me as co-president, Olivia Huang, board vice president of programs, and Kenneth Nankum, board VP of communications. Without their support and contributions, we would not be able to produce this event for alumni benefit. I would like to invite each of our collaborators to self-introduce, Nicholas Rambos, Sarah Simon, and Christina Sanders. Uh, please, each of you take a minute to introduce yourselves and your alumni groups. Hello, everyone, and thanks again for joining. I echo as Constance, thanks to all of those who contributed to making this a fantastic event and excited to hear the remarks from all of our speakers today. I'm Nicholas Rambus, president of the MIT Club of Southeast Michigan. I'm uh, excited to be hosting, uh, again, this event and this background here. Thanks for joining us. Do have a look at our website uh, or LinkedIn group for programming. Thank you. <laughs> Greetings, everyone. I'm Sarah Simon, MIT class of 1972 in civil engineering. I am the coordinator of the MIT Alumni Energy Environment and Sustainability Network. We were founded more than a decade ago and alums are all over the world. We are delighted to be co-sponsoring this event today. We connect, uh, our goal is to connect alumni around the world. We also intend to ed educate everyone with solid information to better understand our three themes and their intersection climate. We also like to support alums and alumni groups in taking action to find solutions to our global challenges. Constance, I want to recognize, especially she was a main architect of this event today, and she connected with our EESN network as one of our earliest EESN ambassadors over the last couple of years. Mick is currently our EESN ambassador. So again, Mick, thank you. The race of the decade is to solve the problem of human impact on the world. And in the US, transportation is our biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions. Bold companies like Ford have stepped up to, to forge a path to a net zero world. So EESN encourages alums to take part in working on these issues and in, in helping to solve them. Uh, you can work on this message by joining our network, by learning about it and telling neighbors, by doing presentations, writing, or even being brave. You can do art about it. Uh, we have many alums who have done some of that stuff. At our website, you'll find out about all the work in individual alums are doing with other public groups and organization. Not all of it. We just find some of it. Alumni Christina Sanders has been a wonderful resource for us today at Ford. Thank you, Christina, and thank you, Constance. Thank you, Sarah. And um, my name is Christina Sanders. I am a MIT graduate of 2018, receiving my MBA from Sloan. Um, I joined Ford right after graduation and have been here for three years and currently I'm working with Mary Culler in the office of our executive chairman. And I'm very excited for this event and I will hand it back over to Constance. Thank you. Thank you, Christina. And, and thank you all. Uh, you've been such wonderful collaborators. Uh, for those of you just joining us, uh, once again, I am Constance Boduro, uh, currently serving as co-president of the Midarca Board of Directors. Um, our mission in Midarca is to connect. We wanna connect alumni to each other, uh, back to the Institute in Cambridge, and to promote the exceptional work um, and accomplishments of our member of our members. We produce programming for alumni benefit and interest. And the city has always been and remains of interest to architects and urbanists. Over the past year and a half, cities and their citizens around the globe have been besieged and challenged, challenged first by the pandemic, and more recently, a summer of climate change induced severe weather events and natural disasters. Midarca alumni understand the power of design and design agency, as well as the role of transdisciplinary research and practice in solving the grand challenges facing the world. 
Mid-Arcata is, is committed to serving as a convener to showcase the work of MIT alumni, especially designers, but also those in other disciplines who are leading initiatives to solve the climate crisis, decarbonize the global economy, and create more equitable and sustainable urban ecosystems. Today's event, Ford's Michigan Central Development, Building the Future of Mobility in Detroit, allows us to begin with the theme of mobility in where else? Detroit, the city which has been at the center of and defined by the global automotive industry for over 120 years. As a Detroiter, I can attest to you the importance of Ford and the Ford family to the region. I can also assure you that when Ford announced their commitment to Michigan Central Station, the community celebrated, but then immediately fully engaged in the planning and implementation pro process, which we will learn about today. You're going to hear from MIT alumni from diverse disciplines, the design, business, and mobility fields, who are leading global efforts to create 20th, 21st century models to transform both the city and transportation. An example of our belief in, tra in transdisciplinary led us to invite our esteemed moderator, Dr. Maria T. Zuber, and we are thrilled when she agreed to participate. And I'll make a brief intro introduction of Dr. Zuber's um, many accomplishments. Dr. Zuber is the E.A. Griswold Prof Professor of Geophysics and Vice President for Research at MIT, where she is responsible for research, administration, and policy. Professor Zuber is the first woman to lead a science department at MIT and the first woman to lead a NASA planetary mission. Among her many duties, she oversees MIT Lincoln Laboratory and more than a dozen interdisciplinary research lab labs and centers. Relevant to today's event, Professor Zuber also oversees Fast Forward, MIT's climate action plan for the decade. Since 1990, Professor Zuber has led leadership roles, including principal investigator, associated with scientific experiments or instrumentation on 10 NASA missions. She currently serves as chair of the standing review board of NASA's Mars sample return mission. Professor Zuber has been appointed and served the last four US presidents. Most recently, President Biden has named her as co-chair of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, or PCAST. It is a great pleasure and honor to turn the event over to our remarkable mo moderator, Professor Maria Zuber. Thank you. Great, well, thank you very much, Constance. And hello, everybody. And um, uh, I'm really grateful for the opportunity to be here today. I'd like to thank the MIT Architecture Alumni, the MIT Club of Southeast Michigan, and the MIT Alumni Energy, Environment, and Sustainability Network for sponsoring this event. It's great to work with you again. Last month, as I'm sure many of you read in the news, the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change issued its latest report. The headline of the press release put it plainly, climate change is widespread, rapid and intensifying, touching every region of the planet. We're all experiencing this now. It seems though every week somewhere on earth, a new record is broken, whether it's for high temperatures, unprecedented rainfalls, persistent droughts, raging wildfires or some other extreme event. As the climate crisis intensifies, so must our response. We have to rapidly transform our global energy system to eliminate carbon emissions. We also have to adapt changes that we are too late to prevent. That's why this past May, MIT issued a new climate action plan, which we call Fast Forward. Fast Forward outlines a three-pronged strategy. First, we need to go as far as we can, as fast as we can, to reduce carbon emissions using tools and technologies that we already possess. Second, over the next decade or so, we can make a lot of progress with existing solutions from wind and solar to better energy efficiency in buildings and transportation. These solutions are absolutely essential, but they aren't enough to completely eliminate global carbon emissions. So the second thing we need to do is invest in, invent, develop and deploy new tools and technologies. On this score, if you'll permit me a brief digression, I wanna share some breaking news about fusion energy. 
fusion, as you remember from your MIT days, is the process that powers the sun. Building a fusion energy device that produces more energy than it consumes has been a decades long quest at MIT and all major physics departments actually. Last week, researchers at MIT and Commonwealth Fusion Systems, a startup that has been spun out of MIT, successfully tested a large high temperature superconducting electromagnet. The researchers ramped the magnet up to a field strength of 20 Tesla, the most powerful magnetic field of its kind ever created on earth. Proving that this magnet could work was one of the main technical hurdles remaining on the track to building the world's first net positive fusion energy device. So we still have a lot of work to do, but we're now a big step closer to making fusion power a reality in the next decade. And this would be a very big deal because fusion energy could provide an affordable, safe, and virtually limitless supply of carbon-free power. This brings me to the third prong of our fast forward strategy. We have to train and empower the next generation, the young people who will take the baton and continue the race to solve the climate problem. MIT students played a key role in the successful fusion magnet test, just as they're actively engaged in all aspects of the climate problem, from clean energy to advocacy, to climate science, to urban planning, to economics. Stopping climate change and adapting successfully to the changes that are already underway are really hard problems. But solving really hard problems is a big part of what defines MIT. Of course, no organization, industry, or country can solve the climate problem on its own. It's going to take all of us, academia, industry, government, civil society, working together if we're going to succeed. Nor is the solution just a technical one. We need new policies, markets, infrastructure, behaviors, and design solutions. And that's why I'm so looking forward to today's conversation. The Michigan Central Project encapsulates this range of solutions, and it also highlights the need to make effective use of existing tools while developing new ones. As architecture alumni know better than anyone, often a good design can accomplish just as much as good technology, or in some cases, even more. Yes, it's essential that we replace our transportation fleet with a zero carbon vehicle fleet, including electric vehicles. MIT is working hard on new batteries and other technologies and Ford has made an impressive commitment to EVs. But through good planning and design, we can also create walkable inviting places where people can get from home to school or work, go out for dinner, run an errand on their own two feet the ultimate zero carbon transportation mode. Given design's importance, the fast forward plan also includes a commitment that all MIT schools with design related programs will incorporate environmental sustainability as a fundamental principle in their curricula. Good design also creates what climate experts would call co-benefits because it not only reduces emissions, but creates more vibrant communities, improves public health, cut costs, reduces the time people spend commuting and so on. In other words, climate change is an urbanism issue. It's a transportation issue. It's a public health issue. Indeed, earlier this month, with the world still in the grips of the COVID pandemic, more than 200 health journals took the unprecedented step of publishing a joint editorial stating that climate change is the greatest threat to global public health. It's an inescapable reality that will face grave consequences if we don't cut carbon emissions quickly. But too often, we lose sight of the flip side of the coin, the profound benefits that we'll realize when we do act decisively. That's what I think this conversation is all about. I'd like to thank Henry, Mary, and Priyanka for sharing their perspectives with us. And we've got a lot of interesting ground to cover today. So we're gonna start with our first speaker, Henry Ford III. 
Henry was elected to the Ford Motor Company Board of Directors in May of 2021. He was an employee of the company from 2006 to 2021. He currently serves on the board's finance committee and the sustainability and innovation committee. Henry is a member of the advisory boards of Henry Ford College, Bridging Communities, Operation Hope, and Southwest Solutions. He serves on the board of trustees of the Henry Ford Museum, the Ford Foundation, Neighborhood Villages, and the Ford Piquette Avenue plant. And of course, I'm proud to say that Henry is an MIT alum, having earned an MBA from the MIT Sloan School of Management in 2010. Henry, thanks so much for being here today. It's great to have you. Thank you. It's great to be here. So, um, so for all of our people out there in webinar land, let's um, let's just start with your background. And can you just give everybody a quick overview of your personal story? Sure, happy to. Um, I uh, grew up in Michigan. Did my uh, undergrad at uh, Dartmouth, and when I was in undergrad. Um, I really sort of became interested in, in teaching, uh, actually, um, much like yourself. And so I, I was a, I started my career as a teacher. I taught um, math, history, and English uh, to sixth, seventh, and tenth graders. Did that for a couple of years, um, and then at that point, I, I started to feel sort of a kind of a I guess a sort of a, a natural pull to work at Ford. Um, obviously, my my family's legacy is important to me, but um, you know, it, working at Ford never felt to me like an obligation or something that I had to do. Um, we were in sort of 2005, 2006, uh, we were sort of on the precipice of the financial crisis and, and things at Ford, like, like many automakers and like many sectors of the economy, uh, were not looking great. And so I wanted to, I wanted to get involved and, and play a role and, um, and, and begin my career at the company. So, um, I spent my first couple of years at Ford working in labor relations, uh, working with the UAW on the collective bargaining agreement. Uh, then I worked in purchasing, working on some of our supplier contracts. Um, then I did my um, MBA at Sloan, came back to Ford and worked in sales and marketing uh, for a couple of different uh, assignments over a couple of years, worked in corporate strategy uh, and then investor relations, um, and then recently joined the board of uh, directors at Ford. Um, and that's my, that's my quick short story. Yeah, great. Fascinating. So, um, so we're, we're looking forward to hearing some of the specifics of uh, what's happening in Detroit, but can you start off by sharing um, uh, your thoughts on just what's happening in the transportation industry in general and how Ford is responding to what I think is a really disruptive uh, time of change? Absolutely. Um, and you're right. It, I, I think things in the automotive industry are, are quite um, disruptive right now, and we are going through a, a pretty significant um, transition. And I would say that, that Ford has um, been undergoing a bit of a transformation over the past five years um, under our, our uh, leadership of our CEO, Jim Farley and uh, Chairman Bill Ford. Um, and, and what I mean by that, obviously, uh, the, the biggest chunk of that transformation is the transition from internal combustion engines to electric engines, um, electric motors. But, um, sort of beyond that is, is sort of how we kind of frame up our, our business model. And so if you look at Ford in the past, a lot of what we were about was um, kind of a, we were, a, we were sort of a, we function at a transactional level, right? So we sell vehicles to dealers and then dealers sell vehicles to, to customers. Um, but we're in the middle of kind of a, a transition um, to really sort of developing lifelong kind of always on customer relationships um, that really sort of extend beyond um, the point of sale. And so obviously this means not only just the vehicle, but also um, new services and over the air updates um, that provide updates to safety and security, um, digital content, navigation uh, for our commercial customers, uptime improvements, productivity improvements, um, and really kind of significantly improving the customer experience over time. Um, and so if you, if you look at that and, and kind of drill down into the, obviously the most significant part of that, um, it is the, the transition to uh, fully electric vehicles. And, you know, we really plan on, on leading that um, revolution. And, uh, you know, we're really, so our, our kind of first step in that is electrifying our, our, our most popular iconic products like Mustang, F-150 and, and Transit. 
Um, F-150 is the best-selling truck um, in the United States. It has been for over 40 years. Um, and so if you want to talk about making an impact and getting people into electric vehicles, um, electrifying the F-150 obviously is a great way to do that. Uh, and so that'll be on sale next year. Um, Transit uh, is the number one cargo van in the world. If you want to talk about getting commercial customers and retail customers into electric vehicles, Transit is the way to go. So that'll be um, on sale later this year. And then obviously the Mustang. Um, we we uh, electrified the Mustang. The Mustang Mach-E is currently on sale. It's the number two electric SUV in the United States. And so we're really, you know, we're really um, um, making, a, I think, a, a pretty big impact quickly. And um, you know, our, our total spending electrification, um, including battery development, uh, is going to be more than 30 billion by 2025. Uh, and so it's it's a very significant investment into kind of this shift from um, internal combustion to electric. So um, that's a quick overview. Yeah, uh, it's it's um, it's incredibly exciting, and I'll tell you, I'm a big fan of the Mustang. Um, so um, can you talk a little bit about um, how much a Ford strategy targets systems beyond those needed uh, for individual product sales? So digital platforms um, that would be shared with like multi, multi passenger buses or delivery vehicles, um, you know, rather than just cars, SUVs, pickups. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so for us, the, you know, we kind of divide up the, um, the, the industry into sort of retail customers and then commercial customers. Uh, and, and we're a pretty significant player in, in both of those areas. And so beyond just the vehicle, obviously the, the services that um, are built on top of the vehicle are becoming increasingly important um, to both our retail and our commercial customers. Um, so they can start to expect um, upgraded services that are delivered seamlessly through over the air updates um, as all of our vehicles, 100% right now in the US are connected, they all have modems. Um, and so we can continue to deliver um, up to software updates, et cetera, to all of our vehicles over time. And that, that electrical architecture um, underlies both our retail and our, our commercial vehicles in the future. Um, so really that's sort of about creating this kind of seamless experience um, that, that really kind of drives value for our customers over time. And so on the commercial side, um, in addition to the retail side, um, we've announced Ford Pro, which is kind of a, our, our um, commercial vehicle sales and distribution business uh, that really will kind of help improve productivity for all of our commercial customers. Um, and it's really kind of a one-stop shop to help those customers increase uptime, um, reduce complexity, reduce total cost of ownership. Uh, and as I mentioned, the, um, the all-electric transit is uh, sort of the first phase of, of that um, initiative. And, and beyond that, then obviously electric F-150 next year and, and a whole host of new products and services down the line. So it really, um, the sort of systems that we're building really kind of do underpin both our, our retail customers and our commercial customers. Great. So, so in, um, in what ways have um, your customers and, your, and actually your employees shaped the vision? Yeah, they've they've been a, a pretty critical part. Um, you know, our, our customers, our employees. Um, you know, we all kind of consider them part of the Ford family. And um, my great great grandfather, you know, really kind of founded Ford with the idea of making a car for the everyday man and woman. And and so I think Ford has always been synonymous uh, with democratizing technology and making it affordable for everyone. Uh, and so that really kind of guides how we think about our vehicles and services both now and into the future. And when we think about our kind of connected future, um, this really makes it even more viable as we now are beginning to really quickly improve vehicles and delight customers through the over-the-air updates that I mentioned. Um, and to that point, um, already this year, we've done 150,000 over-the-air software updates. So it just kind of shows you how quickly that is improving uh, and growing. Um, we have almost a million connected vehicles on the road now. And we expect that to grow to 33 million by 2028. So we'll be able to leverage this capability and continuously improve our vehicles so that they really get better over time. And our customers and our employees are a huge part of that. And in fact, um, we are generating about 80 to 100 terabytes of data every month across products in North America. 
And so our engineers pour over that data that comes directly from the vehicle to really kind of understand how our customers are using the vehicles, how we can make our products better in the future, um, and really kind of enhance, enhance the value for our, all of our customers. Yeah. So, so Henry, I, I would argue that um, the disruption and the change in the vehicle industry now uh, is, is the greatest or biggest change since the, since the founding of Ford originally. And, um, and so I'm, I'm just kind of wondering how your family history is, is really influencing your work and you know, how, it, how it drives you personally and, and you know, how you, basically what drives you to um, have Ford help lead into the future. Yeah, it's it's something that's that's certainly important to me. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the things that I love about Ford Motor Company is that we, um, you know, we really take into consideration um, the community and our customers and our employees. And at the end of the day, what we're really trying to do is is make the world a better place and 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 provide you know, consistent, reliable transportation um, to, um, to the masses. And so, um, you know, part of obviously the transition to electric vehicles is, is, um, is a big part of that. Um, but we also, I think, are very committed to the, the communities in which we work. And um, you're gonna hear from, from Mary in a second. Um, and so I'm not gonna steal any of her thunder. Um, but Mary is sort of like a superwoman at Ford. I think she has at least three full-time jobs. Um, she's in charge of everything in Detroit. Um, she's Bill's chief of staff and she runs the Ford Fund. And the Ford Fund is our internal philanthropic arm. And, and it's something at Ford that we take very seriously. Um, you know, we have a whole team um, that literally is, is there to, um, to make an impact and to give back into our communities. Um, we have, hundreds of thousands of employees all over the world and they volunteer countless hours of community service every year so um you know that that kind of family feel i think at, at ford is is real um you know we have employees who've been at the company for multiple generations and um there's there's sort of an emotional connection um to the company and to the brand and um you know and we're all in it together and and we all kind of work together and and to me that's um one of the most meaningful parts of being at ford Great. Well, thank you so much. So this is my um, this is my last question because we certainly want to hear about uh, Detroit. Um, but we've you know, we've heard from the alumni groups who've created this event that they believe in the power of transdisciplinarity to address climate change. Um, so how might MIT alumni in their various disciplines you know contribute? you know, in impactful ways and, and actually immediate ways because we don't have time to waste in achieving the vision that is shared by Ford? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and so I, I would say, you know, transdisciplinarity has always been uh, kind of a, a, a alive and well at Ford. Um, the, the products that we build are so complex that, um, you know, we have to have um, different teams collaborate in order to bring um, bring those products to market. But you know, never before has, I think, the integration of software, hardware, engineering, design um, been so important as we kind of build this new sort of holistic ecosystem of, of products and services. Um, and, you know, Mary and, and Priyanka are going to speak to this shortly, but, um, you know, a lot of the spaces that we're creating with the Michigan Central Station will not only allow Ford teams to cross collaborate, but also we're going to bring in other startups and local community organizations to all work together. Um, and one of the first buildings that will open um, at the Michigan Central Station will host a, a wide variety of people and startups as part of this kind of innovation hub um, in Detroit, which we're really excited about. Um, you know, and I would say, um, as it pertains directly to MIT, um, you know, Ford has had a strategic alliance with MIT since 1998, at least formally. Um, and um, we have, I think, one of the best um, um, you know, university partnerships um, really in the world and th uh, through other universities in uh, throughout the US and globally, uh, we fund over 400 active projects around the world that really bring together business, academia, government, etc. Um, and, um, and that's really, I think, how we are, you know, going to make a difference in the world. And, and obviously at MIT, you know, we're recruiting 
um, software developers, engineers, um, artificial intelligence, machine learning is becoming more important, data analysis, privacy security. I mean, so we will continue to turn to MIT students, alumni, community professors <clears throat> to help us um, push forward because it's, it's, it's gonna take a team. There's no question about it. There's a lot of work to do. Great, thanks so much. And, and uh, yeah, I just wanna underscore as vice president for research that Ford has been just an incredible long-term uh, partner with us and just thank you all for that. Um, so the, um, I wanna thank you for your comments, uh, Henry. They're incredibly inspirational. And, and you know, I just think maybe the future of Ford has never been as thrilling as it is, maybe, maybe never as uncertain, but, but there's, there just seems like there's so much opportunity there. And, and actually in Washington, policy incentives are being talked about, which would, which would really even, it'll accelerate this transition even faster, um, which, is, which is what we all need. Um, so um, next up, we're gonna hear from um, Mary Culler and Priyanka Shaw. And Mary is the development director for Ford's Michigan's Central Station project, overseeing the project's uh, strategic direction. She's also president of the Ford Fund, the company's philanthropic arm, and chief of staff in the office of the executive chair at Ford. So she really does have three jobs. Priyanka is a senior associate at Practice for Architecture and Urbanism. She's a graduate of the Architecture and Urban Planning programs at MIT, and she's also a recipient of the Lawrence B. Anderson Award from MIT. So Mary and Priyanka, please take it away. Perfect. So um, thank you so much for inviting us here today. Um, I really appreciate it. We would love to take a moment um, to start this conversation first with a video. Um, if someone could play that, we'll, we'll then come back and I'll get the conversation started. In order to know the bones of a city, you have to know every brick of its story the central pulse that connects a community. You have to look up toward its universal ceiling through the wondrous eyes of a child. Detroit is a city of innovators who show the world how to put large dreams on wheels. Traveling up south, people with faith in their stride, pride in the tilt of a hat, the ones who hurtled over hardship and had the heart to still lead. Sometimes you must move with great intention with force, with tears, fiercely into the unknown in order to survive. Michigan Central Station is more than a stained glass memory of our mothers and fathers. It is the bustling new center of the future of global mobility, a destination spot for creatives, a meeting place for the most brilliant. What better place to revolutionize the core of Ford Motor Company than on top of our inspirational real world streets of possibility? This can't be done alone. We need all of you to show up. Search for inspiration. It's under the hood, inside our chest. We are the bold ones, ready to build the world we are moving into, not the one we've always known. Unafraid to go back to our beginning in order to push triumphantly into the future. Imagine the body of our car as a body of a people, painted with thousands of extraordinary colors. Ideas fueling our machines that drop off the most important little people in the world to elementary schools at 8 a.m. every morning. We will never forget when our busy streets turn empty. Bird songs drowning out the morning commute, later to be filled up with the sound of resistance our resilient bones, an assembly line of interchangeable parts, a metropolis of ideas, our minds, the workstations of the future right off Michigan Avenue. A place that remembers how we arrive will create the powerful roadmap to where we must go next. Welcome to the mobility capital of the world. Welcome home. We can't get there without you. <clears throat> uh, 
Great. So um, what I'd like to do, and first I'd like to thank Dr. Zuber. Thank you so much for, um, for your introductory comments. And, and Henry, um, what's really exciting for me is that as somebody who's been working at Ford for a while, I, I just want to reiterate that it's a family company and you cannot find um, a better family um, that's behind a company. And so I'm always an incredibly proud employee um, because of the great ethos that the family carries forward. So I really appreciated Henry's comments. And I also wanna thank Christina Sanders who, um, who helped pull this together. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start um, with a presentation and uh, we're gonna kind of deep dive into Michigan Central and you're gonna get to understand what it is exactly that we're doing here. And if I could just get my screen to work, um, there we go. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. So I have the privilege of, of actually uh, leading the team who's redeveloping Michigan Central. And what's really exciting about this project is it's so much more than a real estate development. I always make sure that people understand that there's a lot about the buildings that um, is going on, but it's really much more than that. So, you know, one of the most exciting days I think we had was the day that we announced the purchase of this building. And, you know, I'm not from Detroit, I'm not from Michigan but I have never seen such an amazing um, collaboration between the company and the community in announcing this incredible event. So for those of you who are from or the area, you know that this building kind of stood as a symbol of the rise and fall of Detroit. Um, as Detroit was coming back pre-COVID, um, this building was still the emblem of kind of Detroit's devastation over the years. And so when Ford announced that we were purchasing it and going to be redeveloping it, it really created a lot of attention. And I thought this was really phenomenal. Um, one of the most interesting things is that um, when we announced this, it actually garnered more social media attention than the launch of a Mustang which just goes to show you how people come together when you're talking about something that's community oriented. Um, one of the things that was frankly the most fulfilling is that we actually, after the station had been closed for 30 years, we opened it for three days and about 25,000 people walked through the station. And you know, this was um, because people hadn't been able to get in for 30 years, it had been shuttered. And there were just so many moments, so many poignant moments. One was this, where literally this group of nuns came in and they just stopped in the middle of the grand hall and just started singing. And, you know, I ran into people in the three days that I was there who told beautiful stories about how much this building meant to them because it was where they had actually watched their father go off to war and he had never come back. Or this was where, you know, they had come from the South and started as a family their life in Detroit. So it really does have such an incredible meaning to the city. And I think that's why this redevelopment is, is providing so much um, of a narrative and it's a powerful narrative about what we can do. So when I think about um, what Ford is doing, it's, it's a very unique proposition and one that frankly is a little bit controversial, um, even within our own company, because we are actually spending a lot of money to create a place that's not just for Ford, but that is about bringing others in and opening it up to community and opening it up to others. And so as we think about this, I always start by saying it is not a Ford campus. A lot of people actually don't understand this. They think this is just gonna be kind of a, a replication of our Ford campus in Dearborn, but it might be a little bit more innovative. But really what we're doing is we're bringing 5,000 people here Half of them will be Ford, but half of them will be other people. And the idea is to bring in lots of different perspectives so that we can actually innovate and work together to solve some of the biggest problems. And those problems really create a possibility to address the following things. First of all, as Henry talked about, Ford is very much about creating the future of mobility. When we think about what creates prosperity, Access to mobility is one of the key things. Um, you know, access to transportation is the number one way to get people out of poverty because they can then have access to jobs, access to education, et cetera. And so we really wanna be at the forefront of creating those technologies to give people that opportunity. We obviously wanna optimize for innovation. And what we mean by that is, like I said, not to sort of be in our silo working on innovative technologies, but to actually be with others 
Um, because I think I always use the analogy, at least for myself, when I play tennis, I always play much better tennis when I play with someone better. And so I think the concept that we've always thought about here is to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with the smartest innovators so that we can all work together on these problems. In addition, we wanna make sure that we are honoring the area that we're in. We are in Detroit. Detroit has this incredible history. This station and this area and neighborhood have an incredible history. And so as we think about that and we think about celebrating that legacy, we wanna make sure that we don't repeat some of the kind of problems of the past. And these are not easy issues, issues such as gentrification, um, you know, that's one of the number one things that the, that the community is concerned about. We want to work with others to ensure that we're addressing those from the beginning. And then what we really want to make sure of is as we develop this, that we're bringing everybody along and that it, everybody has a way to participate in what we're creating here. So Henry talked about the family and um, the Ford family has a really strong history in making the world a better place, as Henry said. And you know, this vision comes from Bill Ford, our executive chair, who has really always thought about this being a pivotal project, not only for the company, for the reasons we've discussed, but really for Detroit um, and the future of the industry. And he really views it as a regional asset. Um, as we look at Michigan as being an innovative state and being kind of the, you know, where the world um, you know, was put on wheels, there's a lot of competition, not only in the United States, but globally in this area. And we don't want to see that future to anyone else. So I think it's really important that we think creatively about how to make sure that we're still a leader. So quickly, I want to run through the vision. And the vision is really about this unique ecosystem, bringing these global innovators together. This is very unique. There are innovation districts around the country. Um, but probably not one that's underpinned by a corporation and one where the corporation is putting a lot of their own capital into creating something that's an open platform. And what I mean by an open platform is that we are inviting people in who are our competitors, because like I said, we want to make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with the best and the brightest. And then, of course, as we think about that innovation district, we want to make sure that it includes everybody. So as we think about autonomous vehicles and the world of electric vehicles, there's going to be a lot of opportunity, which I'll talk about um, a little bit later, to bring community into that dialogue. And then the ecosystem that we're talking about includes a lot of different types of people. It includes investors, but it includes academia. And I'll be I'm glad to, to say that we're actually working with MIT. As Henry said, we have a really strong partnership with MIT, and I think there's a real opportunity here to collaborate. Um, we're also working with industry partners, including the Googles and the Cisco's and BP and Verizon to think about how they bring their expertise to this area. And then of course, these innovation districts don't work unless there's a public-private partnership. So we're working very closely with the state of Michigan and the city of Detroit to figure out how they layer in their programming as well. So let me work through the plan because I, I do think there's more than just the station and I wanna make sure everyone's grounded in it. So this is a great um, visual that I just wanna spend a little bit time walking through. So everyone's very excited about the station and we all are as well. And the station is a historic renovation project which I'll talk about in a minute. And then we have this um, building to the left or to the right on the screen called the Book Depository. And this is an Albert Kahn building um, that frankly, initially when we started thinking about how to lay this out, we were gonna actually tear down and build like a parking deck there. Um, and that just seemed wrong <laughs> because if we're talking about the future of mobility, um, clearly parking decks, we have to rethink sort of what is the future of the vehicle. And so we, we pivoted away from that. And I'll talk about the book depository in a minute. We also are creating a, a Bagley parking hub, which does have kind of traditional parking, but it's much more than that. Um, in addition, there's this whole swath of property that we own that we're going to be creating a platform for innovation and collaboration. But all of this is going to be open to the public. And what I love about it is it's going to connect to other assets in the area. So for example, the Detroit River Conservancy is actually going to be creating a greenway from the riverfront, which is less than a mile away from this location. Um, which will connect right up into this um, destination. So within less than a mile, you can be down on the river on a beautiful 23-acre park that's being developed by the Wilson Foundation and the Detroit River Conservancy. 
In addition, we have this beautiful park in the front, which is city owned, and that's actually being redeveloped as well to be almost the living room of this um, community. And then we also have Michigan Avenue. And what's exciting about Michigan Avenue is that Michigan Avenue has been traditionally overbuilt. And the opportunity there is to create a mobility corridor. And so the state actually issued an RFP um, to ask companies to come in and bid on creating that mobility corridor. And a Google company called Cavenue won that RFP. And they are currently working on that. And they are actually sitting in our factory building, which is listed here. And our factory building opened actually a few years ago. And in that building, we already have our autonomous vehicle um, group and our strategy group working on the future of mobility. So lots of opportunities you see. This is about a 30 acre area, includes some buildings, but includes lots of public space. And then on the sort of left side of the building, we have kind of an opportunity for a new building. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a minute. So very quickly, the book depository, I'm really excited about this building. As I said, I do think this is gonna be the soul of the innovation district. You'll see that the way this building is laid out, the floor plates of this building are perfect for collaborative space, for lab space, for opportunities to bring people in to collaborate on these problems that we've been discussing. Um, it's, it's definitely um, been through hard times, and so there's a lot of work to be done, but ultimately it will have workspace, but it will have maker space, it will have labs, it will have an area where we can actually showcase those innovations, there'll be an event space um, as well, and I just think this building is going to be an incredible asset to the district. You can see here kind of the floor plates, these beautiful, um, we call them Martini Collins. Those of you who are architects probably know <laughs> what they're really called. Um, actually, I call them mushroom columns, I think. Um, but what's beautiful is that we're starting now to punch holes into this building. We have these beautiful atrium skylights that are coming through. And so this building is gonna be filled with light and it's gonna be a very buzzy, active place. At least that's our hope where we'll have a lot of entrepreneurs, smaller startups and collaborative types of um, organizations working here. We will have Ford employees here, but we're actually gonna be very conscious about how many employees we put in here because you don't wanna over curate with one entity because then it just kind of dashes the entrepreneurial spirit. Here are some quick renderings of what it's going to look like. Um, so you can see it's all very open, lots of light. And now I want to turn to the station. So everyone talks about the station, and it's a very exciting process. As I said, it's a historic renovation project. So it comes with a lot of tales, as you can imagine, for those of you who've done these kinds of projects. Um, but we are, in fact, moving forward to ensure that we're renovating to the extent that we can in the most historic way. This will be also a very large part of the vision for the Innovation District, but what's going to be really beautiful about this building is there'll be lots of public spaces. There'll be collaborative spaces, but there'll be restaurants and there'll be shopping, and this will be, I hope, a place that we get right in a way that community feels welcome here. It's a very kind of um, large and grand building, and it sits back from Michigan Avenue. So we definitely want to be thinking about how do we invite people in? And of course, you know, obviously, um, given the pandemic and all the issues surrounding um, the pandemic, we have to think about how these spaces are going to actually be activated. But we're definitely thinking future. Um, so even as we think about, for example, retail, we want to be thinking about what is retail today? It's more around pop-ups. When we think about restaurants, we'll have some traditional restaurants but we wanna be thinking about cloud kitchens and other ways to engage in food distribution and bringing our expertise around mobility to make sure that you know, we are able to actually also um, get that food delivered to people that, that are in other areas. So once again, here's the, the concept. So I've talked about the community space and the amenities. There's gonna be Ford and partner workspace. Um, the towers you'll see when I show you the photos are very long, so it doesn't lend itself as much as the book depository does to those labor laboratory collaborative spaces, but we've been working with tenants on um, opportunities in that space. And then we're thinking about hospitality at the top. We think this will be a destination place with all the people coming here to work with other innovators, and so having some level of hospitality will be helpful. 
So here are some images. This was one of the images from the Grand Hall. I have to tell you, this hall is filled with scaffolding now. That roof is called a Gustavino ceiling, and that's all been renovated, which is kind of amazing. It's hard to see right now because we still have all the, um, the scaffolding up, but we are making tremendous progress. I love this photo because it just shows you this incredibly huge medallion that was up actually on the center of that window. And you can see the little guy next to it. He's actually 6'2". So you can see how big these medallions are in compared to him. So all of these um, pieces are coming down if they need work. And they are either being rehabbed as they are or they're being 3D printed and actually printed in different material and then going back up. This is one of my favorite spaces. This is actually the, the old concourse of the station. So this is the room that people used to walk through to get to the platform. And actually um, the Historic Preservation Office has given us some leeway here. This used to be a roof and it used to have a low light. So picture a roof and then some sort of back lighting but it was not open to the elements. And so they are actually allowing us to build a beautiful atrium here, which I think is gonna be incredible. This is the carriage house. So this was the old carriage house where people used to come um, with their horse and buggy and get dropped off. Um, so this carriage house is actually being um, reimagined to be a restaurant. And so this will also be covered in glass and it will be a beautiful, I think, um, amenity at the station. You can see all the graffiti that's in there. Our hope is that we will capture a lot of this graffiti, we'll keep a lot of it and reimagine it as part of the storytelling that we will tell um, in the building. Because what we wanna make sure of is that while it's getting renovated, we don't wanna forget um, where the building kind of um, went and the story of the building. And so much of that story is about the graffiti. This story I love because it is about the artisans in, um, in Michigan. So you see these um, beautiful columns and you see the tops of them. They were very, very degraded as you can imagine. And here is a Michigan stone worker who took a block of stone and in 475 hours personally carved that block of stone to replicate the, the top of that column. And so that was a really big day when that column was put into place. And I know it was an incredible day for him. Here are the tower spaces. You can see they're very narrow. So we're talking about, you know, with tenants, how we curate those. The views are spectacular. You can see here, you can see Canada. Here's the Ambassador Bridge. You can see the river. You can see how close you are to the river, which is going to be amazing. And then, of course, you're less than a mile from Midtown. Here's a rendering of that. Um, back concourse area, which will have some um, level of food and beverage. Here's the carriage house, which I think will be a beautiful place for people to be. And so now I wanna move to the mobility hub because what's interesting is as you think about future proofing for um, the next era of mobility, you have to work in today's world and think about the future. So we never wanna talk about this being a parking deck, even though there will be parking, but there will be a lot more here. So it's actually gonna have a lot of EV charging technology, including inductive. It's gonna have first floor retail, there'll be Wi-Fi. This is actually gonna be a community amenity because it actually sits away from the station and on that river greenway that I was telling you about that the Detroit River Conservancy is building. So we believe this will be a huge asset for the community and for the area. So not only will it be a parking place, but it will also provide a lot of opportunity for the community to use as well. In addition, here's this platform in the back. And so one of the things that I'm most excited about are the public spaces. The public spaces are gonna be incredible. And you know, we are spending a lot of money on these and you know, it definitely is an issue around you know, how much do you spend? But I really strongly feel that this is what's gonna make the place great. And it is gonna be what connects communities. So here's a perfect example of there's a viaduct underneath um, the platform where we will be opening it up with art and light and bringing in the Southwest neighborhood up onto the platform in an easy way. This is sort of the way it looks now. It will be revitalized. This is that scary viaduct that I was telling you about. So can, you can imagine, this is how people have to come now to get into the station from the Southwest neighborhood, which is Mexican town. So we wanna make sure that we reinvigorate that. 
And then when we think about Corktown, the community is so important. As Henry said, we have a real um, history and community. I also run the philanthropic arm of the, of the Ford Motor Company, and we have actually had a community center in this neighborhood for over 10 years, um, about a couple of blocks from the station. And so we have always hosted events. We host a lot of things here. Um, you know, it's really important that we bring community into the decision making. We meet with them constantly. We have lots of neighborhood club meetings, et cetera. But we also need to think about equity and what that means. So we have workforce development programs. We have a wonderful workforce development program with one of our construction companies who are bringing neighborhood youth in to train them on a lot of the work that needs to be done there. Housing, as I said early, is one of the number one um, concerns of the community. So we've actually already partnered with the city to donate land and they apply for a Department of Housing and Urban Development grant, a $30 million grant to build low income housing in the neighborhood. And they got that grant, which was really exciting. And, you know, even HUD said, the reason we gave you this grant is because you're being underpinned by this incredible corporate um, amount of, of, you know, investment that we know will be really be helpful in this area. And then just around neighborhood beautification, we have, as Henry said, an incredible employee base who are volunteering in this area. And I'm, I'm almost out of time, but I just want to just quickly say that we're also working with innovators. And so we've brought others in to help us think about how do we curate um, some of these spaces and bring the right tenants in, but how do we get started right away? And so one of the ways we've gotten started is to create these studios, these laboratories where we've taken challenges and we've already started to bring people in to solve them. And so we have two innovation studios. One is a community innovation studio, which is around access. And another one is a corporate studio, which is around electric infrastructure. Um, and we also host different sessions. And of course we are very integrated into the community. So just, my final words on this before I turn it over to Priyanka is that we're spending a lot of effort here, but there is no way that we can do this by ourselves because these obstacles are enormous. And you know, while we feel like we are the mobility experts in some way, we need to bring other innovators in to think about all the other issues that we want to solve here. And so these are interconnected challenges and we are so excited about the opportunity to work with different partners to ensure that we're bringing something that's really truly unique, not only to the city, but to the region. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Priyanka, um, who will then talk more about how we thought about the planning as we developed this vision and, and our plan. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. And I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, if not, uh, please let us know. Um, so, as Mary said, I'm going to uh, show you some of the underlying strategic planning uh, behind uh, Michigan Central. Uh, and I'm going to start by sharing my screen. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm so happy to see uh, some friends and familiar faces in the list today uh, of attendees. Um, I'm an MIT alum, SMARCS MCP uh, 2008, so the School of Architecture and Planning, Light Constants, Course 4 and Course 11. And I'm here today uh, also in my capacity as Senior Associate at POW, um, um, which is a practice for architecture and urbanism, a design and planning studio in New York. Uh, and we are the strategic master planners uh, for Michigan Central. And so I'm going to share with you some of the sort of backstory and underlying ideas uh, behind this development. So let's jump right in. Um, so a little bit about POW and our process, uh, which is sort of neatly summarized by this adage, uh, place needs connection. Because places need connection, but place and needs are sort of required to be connected to each other. And it, this is a sort of quick snapshot of, the, of our process that we apply no matter you know, what the project is, whether it's purely an architectural building or it's a neighborhood or a master plan, which is to consider a uh, place, climate context and history and marry them very sort of securely to uh, city, client, and community, and forge you know social, cultural, and emotional connections. And uh, you know 
we really operate on this notion the city is our muse and uh, we operate from this idea that density is uh, fundamental to sustainability it is fundamental to mitigating climate change and it is fundamental to forging innovation and so proceeding from there uh, we kind of formulate our solutions so that takes us to Michigan Central, a historic condition. Michigan Central opened in 1913, the same year as Grand Central Station designed by the same architects, Warren and Whitmore. Uh, so they, you know, here's a firm that had a blockbuster year, uh, if there ever was one. Um, it also didn't hurt that Warren Whitney was a cousin of the Vanderbilts who controlled the New York Railroad Company, extended its operations to the Great Lakes and to uh, mid-Atlantic mid regions. Michigan Central was operational for about 75 years before it closed in 1988 and was subsequently acquired by Ford about 20 years later in 2018. And as you saw, is now being painstakingly beautifully restored uh, in the images that Mary shared. And the station is located, as Mary mentioned, in Corktown. Um, which is also a historic neighborhood. It is, uh, it is Detroit's longest continuously existing neighborhood uh, today. And it was first sent, settled after the opening of the Erie Canal in the 1820s and 30s that made sort of traveling along the Great Lakes cheaper, much more accessible by steamboat. And following Ireland's great potato famine in the 40s, it saw a great influx from Ireland and acquired its name, named for County Cork, uh, Cork Town. Um, after that, it saw successive waves of German, Mexican, and even Maltese immigrants here, drawn all drawn here by the auto industry. And as you can see, it was uh, you know a great train station was placed in the middle of a, um, a very beautifully scaled urban fabric that you know after post-war urban development, large swaths of this were raised. And um, following World War II, uh, there was, you know, just urban renewal later on in the 60s that then cut, um, you know, the uh, Fisher Highway through the neighborhood. And as we have seen in several, several neighborhoods across the United States, these sort of uh, uh, fissures began to sort of tear neighborhoods apart. And one of our, you know, now mandates are how how are these places restitched um, in the presence of these kind of infrastructural moves there? And so those were the existing conditions uh, of Michigan Central upon which um, Pow has uh, you know worked towards a strategic plan. And uh, as Mary showed you, the kind of components of the neighborhood are, of course, the extraordinary Michigan Central Station in the middle, but also the book depository, we have the brass factory site, there will be another building here. And then the, the platform uh, over the um, rail tracks, which we imagine to be the centerpiece public space kind of balancing Roosevelt Park on the other side of the station, uh, that will become both a kind of space for showcasing innovation, but also a public destination as you know, Detroit as a whole revitalizes. So Michigan Central is an innovation district. And like I said, density is one of the biggest drivers of you know, urban success. And we know that uh, uh, density is also linked to jobs and innovation per, per square mile. And you know, when density doubles, we see that patterns, the number of patterns registered jump by about 20%. And so density is also in that way, directly linked to innovation. That idea can be broken down to things like, uh, you know, serendipitous contact, simply the, the number of ideas being generated within a given space. And so what is going to generate the density here? As Mary mentioned, Ford is bringing 2,500 jobs and, uh, is going to then also invite 2,500 uh, other jobs through tenanting, through retail, through uh, just all of the amenities that the neighborhood is going to provide. And this density really underpins the possibility of innovation in the neighborhood. And so the components of an innovation district are you know, economic networking and physical assets. We are talking, focusing more on physical assets here 
today and as we can see you know the physical assets towards what are the physical assets towards uh, you know an innovation ecosystem of today and these might be broken down architecturally spatially to flex spaces lab spaces smaller more affordable areas for startups so as you saw the book depository wonderfully facilitates this and as we think about uh, you know the new building that will happen in the future here uh, we we are going to think about how that physical asset is part of this innovation system as well um, and so to step back again a little bit and talk about innovation districts. And as Mary said, it's very hard to cleanly categorize Cooktown because it's doing a few things. I mean, there is the Anchor Plus model, which is typically anchored by one institution. Sometimes it could be a corporation, uh, but Kendall Square, which we all know is one such example, it's anchored by the presence of MIT and uh, you know the sort of catalytic uh, growth that that uh, makes possible. So in a sense, Michigan Central could be thought of as an anchor plus model, given that Ford is in a way anchoring it. Uh, there is also the idea of, of reimagined urban areas. These um, types of innovation districts typically locate, you know, around waterfronts. We are about a mile away from the Detroit River here, and uh, they tend to re remodel and reuse older buildings. Uh, and so we find that Michigan Central fits sort of roughly these two genres. Uh, the urbanized science park, uh, which is usually found in ex-urban areas. Uh, there is an element of that also simply because of the kind of science and innovation that Michigan Central is going to spot. All of this, though, ultimately has to be layered on a real world city. And we firmly believe uh, that all of our kind of newfangled ideas of smart cities and uh, you know innovation have to be rooted in a kind of good old robust sustainable urbanism and that really is underpinned as professor zuber said uh, by the least carbon intensive of all mobility uh, the walking radius um, and so we are thinking of michigan central as a you know a system of a 20 minute walking radius and then when you apply this idea to a city the diagram on the right shows you that we move from this idea of center and periphery to an idea of a multi-nodal city where every node is a self-contained unit that then begins to relate to all of the other nodes thereby significantly cutting down the need to use carbon intensive uh, mobility to go great distances for extremely fundamental you know, needs and amenities. And so Michigan Central is the center here of that 20 minute circle. And as you can see, it extends almost to the river. Uh, it encompasses North Fork Town, Hubbard Richard, uh, flows into Mexican Town as well. And that this is really, a, in a way, can be thought of as both the zone of influence outwards, but also into the uh, neighborhood or, or, or development. As I said, and the, you know, this is the zone of influence, the center of which is the train station. And whatever happens at Michigan Central then begins to radiate outwards uh, to the neighboring communities. And we are extremely focused, as I mentioned, on restitching this fabric. So it's really, really important to reestablish the major central gateways back into uh, into Michigan Central. And these are some images of how it is today. And, and, and a lot of these um, situations are going to receive very thoughtful upgrades to make them equitable and to make them accessible you know, for the entire surrounding community. And so that we're working with stakeholders. We've identified streets that can uh, gain improvements and partnering, Ford is partnering with the city to do that. Uh, and so there are potential streetscape improvements, there are potential surface improvements, and then there are improvements of direct access to the train station itself. And this is overlaid um, with how does parking and mobility interact because we will be pulling obviously as you saw from the great aerial view traffic from canada from regionally from uh michigan from dearborn the campus uh there and our and arbor is not too much further away and so there are going to be strategically located uh parking facilities that also begin to uh, uh 
you know, give enhanced access to the neighborhood. And then once you get off at the parking facility, there, there is an entire pedestrian uh, plan that uh, and public space plan uh, that enhances connectivity. So um, some of the upgrades of these connectivities are uh, Werner Highway um, goes under the platform and connects uh, Mexican town back up to uh, Michigan Central Station. As you can see, this is a sort of, uh, you know, under lit space, it runs under the tracks. And so we are looking at uh, improving sort of day daylight and access and, and not just access in terms of cars, but also accessibility that this might become accessible to wheelchairs, this might become accessible to bikes and, and a, a become a beautiful walkable path and we might bring daylight in. And so uh, you saw a glimpse of this in Mary's presentation. Um, this is the existing view to Werner Highway in the South. You can see the little uh, thumbnail up top that, can, that will orient you. And we're looking back up at the platform that we are then reimagining as having a little plaza as a foreground and then bringing access up top to the platform, uh, which then becomes a public space. Um, and our colleagues at Mikyung Kim Design are the landscape architects and some of the images that Mary showed is their uh, you know, effort at taking this kind of underlying vision and turning it into a, a, a you know, thriving, wonderful landscape idea. Um, and so here we are looking back at the train station, the train stations to our left, and the mobility platform would be in front of us. And there, so here now we've, uh, you know, ascended the stairs and we're up on the platform. And the platform is kind of animated through activity. It will be a space for showcasing, perhaps, uh, you know, unveiling technology as well. We, we have kind of dubbed it the mobility platform. We imagine that if the companies deem it fit. Uh, this might be a space for testing, but it can certainly be a space for, uh, you know, releasing new technology to the public and generating excitement and become that sort of tech-based destination in Detroit. And now again, kind of going to the other end of the platform and looking back, we've proposed, uh, you know, in the background, you see the location of, uh, of uh, my, what might be the new addition to the campus. Um, and also extremely low slung interventions here because we also heard back from the community that, uh, you know, people did not want the view to this icon blocked. And so the platform also enables the, the station to remain that kind of high visibility iconic structure that it is, you know, something that's a beacon that can be seen from all around. Um, And if the thing that ties all of this together, the connective tissue are the public spaces, which I said, as I said, the landscape architects at Mick Young Kim are designing in detail. And so we've designed a series of spaces, the mobility platform, the plaza down below, the plaza behind the train station, the triangle, and the plaza in front of the book depository, that these, all of these serve, one, to be extremely democratic and public, and two, to connect the buildings as, as Mary started her presentation by saying, this is not simply a real estate project. Um, and so as you, can, as you will see, we are forging these connections through the landscape and through public spaces between the buildings. So it starts to thrive, uh, you know, sort of much like an academic campus. Uh, and so all of this comes together to form a neighborhood for jobs and innovation, the train station, the book depository, the new building, the parking, uh, the, the public spaces uh, and the plazas together. So that's where we were um, last year uh, when all of us, uh, you know, were sequestered by the pandemic. And uh, what I'm going to, the next four slides that I'm going to share with you very, very uh, quickly are how our thinking has kind of needed to pivot as we now confront uh, how work changes because an innovation hub is also a workplace. And it both its kind of financial model, but also its density model, its its ability to thrive um, is fundamentally dependent on how we worked and how we worked is fundamentally changing. So the you know the post COVID future of work, if you look at the ecology of buildings in Michigan Central, 
Um, we have three extremely different buildings. And as Mary explained, the floor plates are very different and they enable very different uh, spaces. So in that sense, it is a wonderfully diverse, like varied spatial ecosystem. And as Ford begins to think about the new building, uh, the way we, we're framing the question is, what does this building want to be against uh, the, you know, the other assets that we already have there? And overlaid on that is, what does this building now want to be in the post-COVID scenario? Um, and so uh, this is just a quick snapshot of design concerns of the post-COVID, you know, workplace architecture. Remember in 2020, everything was about six feet distances and partitions and sanitized surfaces and one-way circulations and improved ve ventilation. And now in sort of post-vaccine scenario, that is all gone. What were really sort of, you know, detailed physical requirements have now turned into structural changes. We know there will be diminished return to work. There will be hybrid return to work. There will be hot desking, hoteling. We will have to solve for Zoom, not from home, but now from work. As anyone who has returned to work knows, when 15 people Zoom together, that's a design challenge. Uh, improved ventilation still remains something that we should all be doing. And so as we look at the new building, we start to think about, you know, in the post-COVID scenario, who is going to come to work and what are the needs that we can anticipate and provide to? And so we kind of broadly think about hard tech and soft tech. Hard tech is something that needs place-based infrastructure for core work. Some of this stuff cannot be replicated inside people's own residences, you know, like prototyping and maker spaces, fab labs, manufacturing, testing. You do need to come somewhere to be doing that kind of work. Soft tech, on the other hand, uh, is work that can be done from home and will likely be done from home more than it used to be before. And, and what might change is that people might like to convene together periodically. What that then requires is that people might want short-term rentals or even extremely sort of, you know, two day week, you know, one week rentals just to bring people together and to have them disperse again. And so hoteling, which is a sort of fancy way of saying uh, you use a, a workspace uh, just part of the time. And so we're looking at, you know, what is new type of, uh, of multi-tenant space? Pre previously, you had large, larger office spaces per tenant. Now, as you bring in fewer workers in at a time, you might be looking at greater subdivision of office spaces. Your entire square footage was dedicated to long-term leases. Uh, you know, this kind of this new world is now going to require us to rethink leases. Um, where we previously, you know, would very efficiently funnel people through elevators and vertical stair floors, buildings are now going to want to be more vibrant, more open. We might, uh, you know, think of connection differently. We might think of physical mobility within the building uh, differently and design for all of that. We are going to have to make workspace enticing. Uh, both to renters, uh, but really primarily also to workers. Uh, so again, things like, you know, the office space was literally just the one was a funneling ground. Now you have your, we might extend to a porous ground and flex spaces that are distributed all over the place. And these are all things we have to think about because work is changing. Uh, and so, you know, just to Pardon summarize. Pardon me, Bianca. Uh -huh. Pardon me. We, we do have a hard stop at 1.30 yes. and we want to yes. give... We want to give Dr. Zuber a few a chance to have a few audience Q and A. That's right. Why don't we wrap up? So this is just a summary of everything that I uh, spoke to before, and uh, you know, uh, buildings will now need to be a framework of flexibility in the new. And I will hand it over to Dr. Zuber now. Thank you, everyone. Great. Okay. Thank you, um, Mary and Priyanka. That's it. What an incredibly um, exciting vision. So, um, so there's a whole bunch of questions here and we won't get to nearly any of them, um, but let, let's just try a couple here. Um, so there, there are um, a number of questions about the mobility needs of those who don't drive. So how, how is Ford gonna participate in hopefully profit from non-drivers, you know, whether it be uh, ride shares, other models, where does rail come into this? You're close to the river. Um, and then there was even somebody asked about air advanced air mobility. 
So, um, so does somebody want to take that on? Absolutely. I'm glad someone asked that question. So actually the district is really, um, even though there's going to be a connectivity issue around the car that Henry talked about earlier, just about how does the car connect to the infrastructure, we are really pursuing micro mobility solutions. We're inviting people in to talk about air VTOL, which is of course, you know, um, electric air uh, types of opportunities. Uh, you talked about the integration of the river. Um, we have the rail, which is currently active only for, um, you know, basically freight. And so we are talking to Amtrak and others about, could we reestablish a commuter rail, potentially even from Ann Arbor to um, Michigan Central? So I hope if we do this right, you are going to see kind of a plethora of different um, types of mobility and frankly, probably less about the car and more about the micro mobility solutions and other types of offerings that are coming. Um, okay, Henry, this is, this is one for you. Um, so there were a lot of questions in the chat about um, the charging infrastructure. And um, you know, obviously, if, if there's more charging stations, you're gonna sell a lot more electric cars and it's gonna speed the transition. So, so how is Ford thinking about that? Are they thinking about participating in growing or depending on the local governments or federal governments to do it? Uh, how are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, charging is definitely something we're spending a lot of time on, um, working both independently and collectively with um, you know government government agencies. Um, and so you know we think about charging, I guess, kind of in three different buckets. So there's going to be obviously home charging, and we're trying to make that as as seamless and as easy for customers as possible. Um, then there's obviously going to be public charging. Um, Ford, right now, Ford customers have access to um, America's largest public charging network. I think there are all, already over 60,000 plugs and obviously many more coming online uh, almost daily. Um, and then for a lot of our commercial customers, it's, it's going to be really about depot charging. And so earlier this year, we acquired a company called Electrify, um, and they are really going to kind of help us um, um, kind of manage uh, the, the software to manage sort of all the charging needs for our um, commercial customers so that they can obviously um, lower their energy and operational costs. Um, and it'll be a one-stop solution, um, rapid deployment for commercial customers. Um, so it's, it's a, it's, there's a lot of work uh, going into it now. Um, and uh, it certainly is a key part of our plan going forward. Right. Henry, well, I've got you one, one, one more for you. Um, you're going to have to retrain a lot of workers um, who, who are now working in the sort of combustion engine to the um, electric vehicles. Uh, how are you going about doing that? I took a trip to Michigan to look at local community college uh, up there that are, that are really doing a lot. Are you depending on them? Or are you doing some of it in-house? Yeah, it, it's a combination, I think, of all of those. Uh, a lot of it in-house, a lot of it partnering with colleges and universities. Um, you know, certainly um, a, a lot of reskilling is going to be required. Uh, we're bringing in new talent every day, um, upskilling existing talent. So it's um, it'll be a holistic uh, solution that's um, that's um, that will certainly require partnership um, with a lot of entities. So it's it's underway and ongoing. Great. Okay. Um, a number of questions about the uh, sustainability goals for the project. How how are how are you doing your heating and cooling? Yeah, so um, obviously the train station is a historic renovation project, so we're doing the best we can, but already we announced that um, all the power is going to be wind power. We've been working with our local energy company to bring all the power to the area by wind, um, and there will be other sustainability components um, in there. We're not moving towards any sort of lead platinum status designation because we think there's, you know, a lot of other opportunities. But um, Mick Young Kim, who Priyanka talked about, who's a Boston landscape architect firm, um, there are just lots of wonderful sustainability ideas as part of her efforts as well. And we'll have those on our website if anyone's interested. There's more information on our sustainability goals. Great, and hopefully and we'll get to. And if I could add one yeah, point ahead. to that. Uh, just to say that the reuse of buildings is in, is an incredibly low embodied carbon process. That there is something so fundamentally sustainable about this development, given that the buildings are being retrofitted. Uh, you know, so it, it it starts not at zero, but already at a higher. 
Great. Okay, last uh, last question here because we need to wrap this up. But um, uh, there was a question here about the inequities um, of uh, people within the city versus in the suburbs, and really, how do you foresee this project um, really helping underserved communities within Detroit, and not not simply being a destination for people outside the city to come into? Yeah, well, I hope I covered some of that, but I mean, clearly access to mobility is critical. Clearly workforce training is a huge component. The third building that I mentioned, we're thinking about making that a job training hub for future tech and the future, um, you know, EV technicians, that kind of thing. And, and they, and the community has been a, pro a part of our process. And so things like housing, um, you know, things like youth um, engagement, those programs, you're going to see a lot of those programs here. So I, I hope you know, we can't solve all problems, but I do think that we are trying to touch points and where we're not experts, we're bringing the experts in to help us, including foundations who have been really helpful in their, in their engagement with us today. Great, thank you so much. It's an incredible project. Um, so we're unfortunately out of time. So I'm gonna turn it back over to, uh, to Constance to, to bring us home. Thank you so much, Professor Zuber, and um, gratitude to all our excellent speakers. As you said, uh, Professor Zuber, an incredible program and, uh, you know, so complex. Uh, thank you all for our attendees um, and uh, your wonderful questions. Uh, we know that MIT alumni and friends like to stay connected. So this slide uh, shares a variety of web links of all the um, uh, producers, collaborators, speakers uh, that you saw today. Um, uh, our colleagues at Ford wanted to be sure there were a lot of EV questions, so please go to their media.ford.com uh, website if you want to learn more about uh, EVs. Um, please do make contact, uh, join our groups, uh, share your ideas, and um, we, uh, we encourage you to stay connected with MIT. Thank you so much uh, to everyone for your participation. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.